Well, hello, everybody. My name is John Barnwell, and, my, and I'm here with my oldest friend, my greatest teacher, and my most gifted pupil, Dr. Douglas Gabriel, for the next installment of Interview with an Exorcist. And we're outside the greater metropolitan area of Detroit, trying to bring people up to steam on this wild adventure that we've shared together. How are you doing there, Douglas? I'm doing great. How are you today, John? I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited because, you know, we're at the stage where we can now, like, um, time serve. We can, you know, look back and forward, and then with the uh, 2020, uh, we can look back on the past and make some even uh, insightful uh, judgments about some of the things that happened. And the further... It seems that you get away from these things, the more it is that you get the proper perspective that you need. So yesterday, I had a conversation with Robert Thibodeau, and it brought back so many things. You know, basically, when you're with Robert, you just kind of sit back and listen because he's going to carry the show. And so he describing describing all these things. I'm going, and I was there with every one of those. And that sounds crazy. If you heard him say that, you would think that he was making it up. Yeah. But he wasn't making any of it up. It was that well, he, much he, more. He kind of crisscrossed a, a few facts regarding things, you know, like yeah. because that whole thing about the monastic club ritual, there was that never happened. But there no, was no, wait, wait, there wait. was a, there was that little gathering that we did to, to try and do a working that was based upon the three pillars of Freemasonry, right? Well, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. And which is uh, wisdom, beauty, and strength, right? So that's like in the tree of life, right across the middle section. So you have uh, the sphere of Jupiter and the sphere of Mars, and then in the center is the sun, the sphere of beauty, right? And uh, that, and the whole idea with the craft that that we discussed on other occasions, you know, Freemasonry. What is up with that? Well, wisdom, beauty, and strength. It's about developing character. And that's the point of true Freemasonry. Although it has been hijacked by very questionable forces in certain cities and certain lodges. So it's become a very controversial subject, but it does tie into some of this conversation that we've been having. Behind every great man is a greater woman, I've always said. And behind Robert was Colleen Smiley, who ran the Ohm Cafe, which is a vegetarian uh, macrobiotic restaurant that had previously been the Mayflower in its location in Ferndale. And then Robert moved over to Berkeley, where I ended up living and having uh, three children in a little, uh, little uh, house in Berkeley and right down the street from the Mayflower. But... Um, Essentially, we forgot about Colleen because Colleen was, anytime she wanted, she could have been a member of the Manasseh Club, but she was too busy doing all her bhakti yoga stuff, you know? Well, that's why I brought up the Freemason thing, because she was included on that. And it was something that we did at the bookstore for a very short period of time, and we ended it officially in the whole deal. But uh, she's a marvelous soul. I mean, geez. If we could get her on here, but she's so uh, unassuming, she would feel funny talking about all the great stuff that she's done. Yeah, she'd not consider it great, though she ran like these community houses for decades and had uh, two children with Robert, uh, who are both wonderfully successful these days. And uh, And she was to work with Jewel Hart. Yes. Well, I mean, we, wow. she, she married Gaelic Rinpoche. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on. She married like the top Tibetan teacher in the English speaking world, maybe the world. Hard to say. But anyway, uh, so yes, yeah, she was very, very connected and she was a co-mason. She was in theosophical co-masonry. She was a high degree in co-masonry. And so she was also an astrologer, but she was also uh, into into serving people. She was into service and she, that's the reason she ran the restaurant, uh, Ohm Cafe forever. I don't remember how long, but uh, I was there when it was created. It was so funny the way it was created because the anthroposophist had created a coffee shop. They might have all 
called it a coffee shop plop because it was a total disaster. Momo's Cafe. Momo's Cafe. So we're sitting there uh, in Momo's, which what had previously been the Mayflower. Yeah, that's right. Trying to imagine that's hard to believe, actually. <laughs> Whoa. The Mayflower was this, you know, place you'd go in and you you were, as Robert described it, it just keeps opening up. You're like you you open a book and you're in another room or, you know, it's, it's a little tiny room, but inside it seems like it's gigantic. So anyway, here's this little cafe, uh, Momo's, and it was a total disaster. And it was uh, it got everyone to donate to it. So it would be a, a wonderful community place for music and conversation and to advance anthroposophy. And if anything, it turned people off to anthroposophy because it was just a disaster. So we're sitting there and Colleen says, I don't know, but Robert and Colleen, I don't know who came up with the idea to create a macrobiotic restaurant because we were all trained in macrobiotics. And as Robert pointed out yesterday, Robert brought me Shokushi to this area to give talks and do so on and so forth. But anyway, we're sitting there and we're saying, okay, uh, he got, they got to inherit all the nice uh, tables and the chairs and all this stuff. But they said, well, what are we going to name the place? And uh, it was called Momo's. And on the outside it said M-O, M-O. So we walked out there and I said, pull off the first and the last letter and you got Ohm. And we just burst out laughing. That's how it was named. It was an accident. It was, or, no, it was because we were, I was lazy. You know, so we were sitting there creating the menu and all this kind of, because I'd been, uh, had run vegetarian restaurants before and all the vegetarian restaurants in Detroit, I'd always go make friends with the people and really get connected into it. But, you know, it, it's amazing to think back on those times. So Colleen, remember in our, um, let's just call it, so we don't get in trouble and people start getting all worked out. Uh, let's just call it um, uh, sacramental ritual that we created. In the stage one, we were all females. We were all sisters of the craft. And then there was a stage two and a stage three, and we were writing this kind of stuff. You know, before I'd gotten a Doctor of Divinity at the Universal Life Church and had written my own creed, my own uh, seven sacraments, you know, I got to write my own religion, which I was really into. I thought that was great. And did you and get so, to wear did you get to wear the funny hat too? I, I could wear any hat I want, and in the Universal <laughs> Life Church, you can give yourself any name you want. <laughs> So whatever the, you know, the best name you can think of, whether you want to be a pope or a bishop or an archbishop or a cardinal or whatever, that's fine. You just write up your stuff. You invent a religion, send it in, and bingo, you can marry people and you can conduct religious services and be tax-free. So I, as you probably know, for years I was that because that I was in that, but I was also an ordained priest and also had a doctor of divinity from the Catholic Church. But the point is, is that, I like to marry people. I like to go to celebrations and I like to do Sufi dancing. So, you know, I was totally into that. Married a lot of people here in Michigan. Uh, but when I say that, people always go, how many times did you get married? No, no. I was the, officia, the, the official and I could sign the marriage certificate, right? So anyway, coming to Detroit, I had looked around all my life for psychics and looked even in the Anthroposophical Society and looked uh, in the Sufis and looked in everything and, and you know Catholic Church and very few there, and uh, looked all over and couldn't find any. But I come to Detroit and what happens? It's the new age, and everybody's psychic, and everybody wants to be psychic, and everybody want you know there's nothing weird about being. You could say, yeah, I'm an exorcist, and they go, great, <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, I wrestle with demons, uh, it, it, you know, and uh, you think that's a great thing? No, everybody was into that. And nowadays, the whole world needs an exorcism. Holy Lord, wh what area of our government doesn't need an exorcism where the demons, demonic laws, have taken over the freedom of human beings and turned them into automatons? You can't name an agency. Or, or you know, people would, in the old days, even myself, I fell for many years ago, Irvin Laszlo, the top thinker for the United Nations. And, but he came up with some great theories and some really good work. And I like that. But the reality is if you're going to give the United Nations any credit, people will always say, well, what about UNESCO? 
<laughs> UNESCO that is trying to sterilize everyone and and put chips in yeah. children's brains and you, you can't think of anything worse than the things that the United Nations has created. So in those days, of course, we were, you know, it, it wasn't long, it wasn't before, too long before that that they ran a pig, the yippies, yuppies, I mean, ran a pig for president, right? I voted for the president. There's the only, you know, only time I got out of my, uh, you know, hippie mode and went down and, and voted because I didn't believe in voting because I could see psychically that they were fake. I could see they were manipulated. I could see they were uh, subliminally controlled. And so, you know, I had a kind of a negative attitude for uh, most of my life. I never even listened to the radio in the car. Yeah. No, none of that. No, no TV, none of that. No human contact. So I come to Detroit and now I got everything. This is the smorgasbord of psychism. And uh, I'm appreciated. I'm even paid you know, for what I do, which I used to have to hide. So I still continued to hide it because for many years I was in the Waldorf Institute, which I think we'll talk about next time. But uh, in all those years, I and then as a Waldorf teacher at the Detroit Waldorf School and teaching at the Waldorf Institute, I hid the fact that I was a reader. I hid the fact that I was clairvoyant. You know what happens when someone finds out you're clairvoyant and you work with them? They're convinced you're the devil. And that no matter how you came to your psychism, it doesn't matter. You got it through some kind of, you know, dark, black magic means. And, you know, if people don't understand these things, then they're terrified of them. Now, we talked before about an astrologer, and that's where we'll jump off here. The astrologer, being an astrologer, is predicting the future many times. A psychic right. does what? Predict the future. You go to the palm reader. Remember, the in the old days, the only psychics were the lady who had the neon palm outside of her house. Come in for a palm reading. You know, And you'd go in there, and she'd have a glass crystal ball. Ooh, she's going to use the grass, you know, going to read your soul. And she'd give you an astral reading. We talked about that last time. She'd read your desire body. And that's about it. But here in Detroit, no, we had really, really good people that were amazing at what they did. And like we've pointed out, Michigan is a, a, it's a core. It's a hub. It's a forge. It's, um, it's an industry. It's a, it's a, it is a place where this stuff is created, developed, and then sent out to the world. We used to say in, in the, uh, as Robert called it, the Manas Club or the Manasic Club. You can call it either one. We used to say that as we studied why Detroit was special, well, first off, it's the kidneys of America. It runs the cars, right? So we're like the kidneys. We are, we are testing and sensing the flow of the blood, cleaning it out, and making sure everything flows very nicely. You know, that's, you know, so we are in a way like the kidneys and we sit on gigantic salt mines. And so we would have these conversations of why is it that so many brilliant people came to Detroit? And I think because it is a spiritual center. And as Tyler has pointed out repeatedly throughout all of these uh, conversations, that uh, she even made some very cute um titles and stuff, you know, the crazy wisdom of Detroit or the, you know, psychics and astrologers of Detroit, the center of spiritual development. I'm afraid that the more we reflect upon these things, the more I think that's true. Well, I mean, you could look at it like alchemically. And so what do we have? We have the salt mine south of Detroit. As we go up into North uh, Oakland County, we have all these lakes that actually have sandy bottoms that are a remnant from the ancient ocean that was left here after the the uh, receding of, of the ice at the end of the ice age. And then you have all this water. So you have silica, salt, and water. And anybody who's studied alchemy any length of time would, would think of that as being extremely critical. Absolutely. And that silica, as Steiner pointed out, you go to granite mountains if you want to have good thoughts. Uh, but you move to a temperate zone if you wish to be a philosopher. And Goethe said that too. Many people said that. 
you have to have the change of the seasons if you really want to develop a mind that is mm, uh, philosophical, as it were. Now, we are born with somewhat of a melancholic temperament, but move to California. Are you going to be melancholic when you're out there surfing? No. Move to New York. And you don't get to be melancholic because then someone will take advantage of you. You know, I mean, you talk, you talk about the extremes, you know, but here in the heartland, surrounded by all that water, we have a completely different perspective. Well, but again, with New York, remember that Manhattan is a giant chunk of granite. So ah. it, it's like a nerve center for, for uh, world economy. Oh, yes. I could tell you, I used to, every summer, I'd go to New York, stay at the Christian community until the Christian community camp went out to upstate New York, taking underprivileged children from New York on a camp experience, which was, let me tell you, an extraordinary event every single time. It was a, a, a spiritual awakening for me every single time. But uh, I also knew the New York Waldorf School very well. And one day I'm teaching there, doing some kind of teaching, I forget. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a stupid story to insert here, but it kind of shows you what cities are about. So um, I'm teaching this class in like a fifth grade. There's this sweet little girl. She's in the back of the room and she's just as sweet as could be. But the teacher, they called me in to help because the teacher couldn't control the children. And these children would, they'd start wrestling with each other and roll around on the floor if, you know, if the, if the teacher was in there. But with me, it wasn't quite so bad. But I turned my back and they, these two boys are wrestling. And they're wrestling on the floor and the girl gets up from the back and she picks up the picture because I'm drawing a picture on the board and she brings it up to me. But on the way, she steps on the face of one of the boys on the on the ground, doesn't even notice him, steps on his face and walks up, shows me the picture. <laughs> and I say, that's good. Now, you might you might try a little blue around here. Or blue. And she goes, oh, good. Oh, walks back and again, steps on one of the guy's heads on the way back. That's what New York will do for you. Well, I remember, and I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it because it fits perfectly. Uh, for a short period of time, I ran the office at a Waldorf school of which uh, Douglas was principal. <laughs> so it, it's like uh, intermission time, either lunchtime, whatever. And there's, it's like an inner city school and there's all these kids and they're all like, you know, uh, wrestling and, and gyrating all over them. It's just this whole bluster of activity. And all of a sudden, I look way down the hall, and here comes Mr. Gabriel. And he's walking, and he's got his class behind him in two rows. And you can see how these kids are looking up at him like reverently, right? Like they have just this uh, incredible respect for him. And he comes up, and as he approaches the office, all the, the craziness with all the kids calms right down and they all turn around and they look at Mr. Gabriel. <laughs> this happened all, you know, <laughs> it, it, this would keep happening. And he knew them all by their names, by their first names. And mind you, in this particular school, it was in Southfield, they, the they, uh, tendency in that generation within the black community is they would make up like French sounding first names. And so, I mean, for me to try and remember that all these kids' names when there was only maybe one Peter and uh, one Joe and, <laughs> and two Johns and the rest, all these other names that their mothers just kind of tried to make up for, uh, and, and look like they were French, right? Because the, the Blacks during uh, World War II were treated really well when they were in France. And in fact, a lot of them stayed there. I knew Pat Flowers, he used to come to the, the Mayflower, we'd go have lunch, and he was the piano player for Billie Holiday. <laughs> and he would go to Europe with her. He started when he was like 15, 16 years old. He was protege, uh, uh, stride piano with Fats Waller and that whole scene coming out of uh, the middle of the country, you know, like Kansas City and all that. But anyways, he was living in Detroit and playing at, at the rich... Uh, country clubs out in uh, Gross Point, you know, and, and guys like Henry Ford and, and Max Fisher would sit around his piano and he would pl play all these tunes. But he, he'd go with us and it was like he was uh, 
he studied yoga, right? And he would always bring in and swap out books to get more books on yoga. And he lived to a, a hale old age and was just an incredible player, could play Chopin unbelievably. Well, New York was tough back in those days, but Detroit was tougher. And when I came to Detroit, <clears throat> people just couldn't believe it. They said, you know, no, there's no way. You know, you're like this uh, spiritual person. You can't move to Detroit. That's insane. Well, I liked it because I had access to all these amazing things. But, of course, there was a dark side to Detroit. I think four, four or five times I had a gun stuck in my face. And But remember, I had hair down to my waist, and I was attempting, like I am today, to have that look where no one messes with you. So no one ever messed with me. I was never really, you know, except a gun was pointed in my face. And then I have to say to the person, you know, next time you try to rob someone, you got to put some bullets in the gun. I can see you have no bullets in it. You have a revolver. I can, you want to come over to my house for lunch? And then sometimes I'd even hire them because I had crews of people working for me at this, to these doctors that I worked for. So sometimes I'd literally hire the guy trying to stick me up. That was Detroit for you. You know, you, you just, you had to turn things around. And it was so dark, except for the spiritual light. And then when you look at it, you go, well, the Krishnas didn't have a, a, a more fantastic place than here in Detroit. And if you went over to the Krishna house on the way, you'd go, whoa, am I in, you know, bombed out Beirut? Am I, is this World War Three? Has this, does anyone live here? It was that bad. And it was, you know, what every few houses, the houses burn out because they just burn them out for fun. And so there was a lot of crime. Uh, I'm sorry to have to say it, but, you know, uh, a neighbor on one side was killed answering his door. A neighbor on the other side was killed. Uh, there were times that we found in my own dumpster uh, a human body. Someone had been killed and put thrown in the dumpster. That it was not uncommon in Detroit. The neighbor across the street, same thing. So if you walked one block away from where I lived, there were crack houses all over the place, and you could get shot and killed. But in the little three streets that I lived on and where the Institute was and where the Detroit Waldo School, it was a sanctuary that was just beautiful. These were all like mansion houses, as I've mentioned before. And um, while you were there, you were kind of in this sacred space. Go a few miles to the east, and you come to what John just mentioned, Gross Point, some of the richest people, all the richer people from Detroit, you know, Dow Chemical, Ford, Fisher, all, all, all those people. Oh, my gosh. Filthy rich people lived out that direction on, the, on Lake St. Clair with their yacht clubs and so on and so forth. But if you headed towards downtown, you couldn't find a grocery store to buy food. There was hardly anything open. And it looked like a um, ghost town and you weren't safe. But, you know, I looked like a hippie. And so I was able to move in and out. People would wonder about that because it really was that close. I mean, you'd be in Gross Point and you go to the edge and then you look across the street and it's like, uh, you know, some kind of uh, bombed out derelict neighborhood you know i mean it's just incredible but the way it was understood in the in the hood so to speak was that if they stayed in their own neighborhoods they could do all this stuff and, and get away with it basically but if they went after the houses in gross point they would come after them relentlessly so there was there wouldn't be as much crime there as you would think you know, uh, because because of that kind of knowingness, shall we say, of the criminals. Yeah. Faith Foster lived up three streets into Gross Point, three streets to the other side. It was you're taking your life in your own hands. OK, but on her side, police will show up in 30 seconds. They're always on patrol. No later than one minute will the police show up if you call them in Gross Point, Gross Point Woods, Gross Point Hill, you know, all those Gross Points. And the further east you went, the more uh, rich it was until you came to like the Henry Ford mansion that was on the water, which is a huge place and all these different things. But so I I was associating with people who were filthy rich. Matter of fact, I had a friend whose dad owned a, his own bank out there, the biggest bank in Gross Point. You know, I was uh, dating his daughter. 
So I'm associating with these people, but like you say, there was an invisible iron curtain that was there in between Gross Point and Detroit, but that was there in all the different subcultures in Detroit. Detroit has, has many, many different people from many different countries in it, speaking many different languages. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the district in Hamtramck has more foreign languages spoken than any other district, school district in America. That's the way it is. So now has it changed? Oh, Detroit's become beautiful now. I always tell people, you know, oh, you know, I'm scared to go downtown. They're like, are you out of your mind? It's beautiful downtown. And it really is. They, they transformed it magnificently, in my opinion. Yeah, but you really have to go to the area that's been transformed. And that's what people don't understand about Detroit. That's why I, I make the joke, it's a nice place to live, but you wouldn't want to visit here. Because you have to know, oh, I can't go there. I can go over here. And, you know, there's all these different kind of ecologies of, of, of society. And as long as you stay in this bubble, you're covered. But if you get over here, you could get into some trouble. Now I'm, I'm drifting because I got to respond to that. So I'm going to drift up in more modern times. You know, I um, ended up being the superintendent of 24 schools, some of them being um, juvenile detention lockup centers, a lot of them, <laughs> and um, uh, strict discipline academies. So I got well, supposedly the worst children there were. And so I got to know them very, 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 very well. Now, to begin with, here I am teaching in the exclusive, only private, non-denominational, non uh, whatever re religious school in Detroit, a private school in the old building called the Liggett Building, where all of the rich initial auto kings lived in that neighborhood of Indian Village and sent their children to that school. So this school was beautiful the way that it was built. It was just beautiful. So here I'm at this school, you know, teaching these uh, children who are well off, you know, and uh, later I end up dealing with the children who. Uh, had the hardest time you can possibly ever imagine, the most difficult scenarios, life scenarios you can ever imagine. And never having a problem with any of them. I love them all, you know, and that's the thing. As long as you love the child, and look, if you if you love them, wouldn't you know their name? So, of course, I had to know it in the name of every child. I also knew the name of their parents. And why? Because that's the key. That shows you interest. If you don't have interest, you can't be a teacher, in my opinion. So uh, I got to have the full spectrum when I was in Detroit from uh, living the life of uh, a hippie on the street to, you know, uh, going to all the different uh, relig uh, religious centers and different um, uh, it, from synagogues to uh, temples to churches to you name it and, and dealing with all these different kinds of people. And really, I, I found in the end that I loved it, though, after all oh, about. I don't know, 10 years or eight years. I said, that's it. When I'm done teaching my class from first through eighth grade, which is what we do in Waldorf schools, I'm going to go to Hawaii. I did end up going to Hawaii, but that's another story for another day. So here we are in Detroit, the Psychic Center USA, in my opinion, as well as a Spiritual Center USA. You know how many apparitions there have been in this area? I I personally have checked out a dozen apparitions. About half of them were real. Okay, well, where else are there apparitions that, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people don't gather? There was a boy who kept seeing angels. I was standing right there, and he'd see the angel. He'd go into trance. You could see the, I could see the angel. There was, what are you going to do? So I had to tell the Catholic Church, you got a live one here, you know. This is a real one. So what did they do? They came out. They beat up the boy so bad, you know, they sent someone to the Vatican that the boy stops seeing the angel. You know, that's sometimes what happens. But anyway, with the Waldorf Institute, let's remember, they are teaching you to be clairvoyant. Now, that is a, a rash statement by for me to make, uh, according to some anthroposophists. But Rudolf Steiner wrote Knowledge of Higher Worlds and Its Attainment. He wrote The Stages of Higher Knowledge. He wrote a book called Theosophy, where he describes the exact conditions of the spirit would land, of heaven. I'm working on an article now on the future Jupiter condition of the earth. It is the most accurate description of heaven and how heaven got there and how we participate in it 
of any religion anywhere. So here you are. I'm going to school. Why? Well, first off, you probably know this. This will be boring. <laughs> but I graduated high school when I was a sophomore. So I went into college and I got an associate's degree in computer science by the time the rest of my cohort graduated high school. Then I went to the military and got another degree in um, radio propagation. Basically, it's a radio broadcasting degree. And then, uh, but before that, when I was with Father William, I got the full uh, preparation for ordination, which is basically four years of study. And so basically it's equivalent to, to a BA or in their system, the way they look at it, it's a master's degree. That's, what, that's why when you get ordained, you become a doctor of divinity because you already have a master's degree. So technically I had already been trained with a BA and an MA and had an associate's degree in computer science by the time I graduated high school. Now that sounds like, it's like some of the stories Bob told yesterday. I can tell you, he didn't make up any of those stories. I'm not making this up. Call my sister, she'll tell you. She was there. But anyway, so, you know, I was an overachiever, obviously. But the point is, and I was trained as an exorcist and I was trained also, uh, I was a trained parliamentarian. I. I was trained as a, I had two form, what, uh, one form of massage certification. So I was making money all the time because I was just obsessed with doing stuff, you know, because I wanted to be anywhere but at my home with my parents, my dad particularly. So anyway, Detroit gave me this uh, option that I never had before, which was just to be myself. And in doing so, it just opened up all these different worlds and Anthroposophically, I came here, not, uh, and then I, well, when I went to the priesthood, uh, or, uh, yes, when I went to the priesthood, I went and got higher degrees because they recognized my training. So I got a, a PH, two PhDs, a Doctor of Divinity through the Jesuits. So when I came to Detroit, I had all these degrees. So people would just say, oh, no, you don't have to do that. You just come, you know, come on up here. You, you, you can just go on through the line. But I started again. And so I got a BA, double BA. Uh, I mean, with the, uh, it was in history, British history, by the way, and anthroposophical studies. Now, that there was a college in America that gave out a degree in anthroposophical studies. A few years after this, it had been going for years at through Mercy College, but a few years afterwards, some archbishop was there at a graduation and looked down on the card and said, what the hell? You took classes called karma and reincarnation and they ended the institute. The second they really found out what was going on there, the Catholic bigwigs through Mercy College canned it. But later, through the Jesuit University, through University of Detroit, they started it up again. And so I taught there also. And that was uh, even a master's degree. But so I got a BA in Anthroposophical Studies, which means I studied to be a clairvoyant. I have a degree in it. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, first off, because... When you start getting into the whole idea of clairvoyance and the, dealing with the super sensible as a reality, just because you can't see it with your physical senses doesn't mean that there isn't other senses that you can have that give you the ability to perceive that which is not perceived by your physical senses. And it's, it's uh, what Douglas is describing here. It's an interesting dynamic because Rudolf Steiner says that it was through Aristotle and certain conclusions that he presented regarding the pre-earthly existence. And his I, he came up with the, that notion that there's a new soul created when you're, when you're born. And therefore, the end result of that, if you, if you just keep uh, pursuing that line of thought in an abstract way of thinking, you're going to come to the end that there's nothing at the other end or some kind of structured uh, situation such as was being presented by the church. But it didn't include reincarnation and karma. 
Yes, that was really the mission of uh, Rudolf Steiner and his teacher. One was supposed to teach reincarnation, the other was supposed to teach karma. So Steiner gave his karmic relationships, which basically told some of the previous incarnations of people. And it's in some cases you go, oh yeah, that's perfectly logical. In other cases you go, oh, come on now, really? So you know he didn't make it up just by association or logic. No, he then gives you all these reasons why he knows this. And you go, okay, so here you have a guy who, uh, Rudolf Steiner, my hero, who uh, reads the Akashic Records. Cool, man, because I've been reading them since I was a child. And I can tell you, it's exactly what he describes. Exactly the stages, exactly, exactly. So here I was in school being paid through uh, the GI Bill because I'd been in the military uh, to go to school. And I was in school for 11 years and I got a master's degree also in Waldorf administration, Waldorf school administration and public school administration. And I became certified K through 12 and I became a school certified school administrator because I did. I, it wasn't because mm, I was trying to show off. No, it was because I just couldn't decide. I liked all the all of them. I liked all the, the children, the people in college. Every I liked all the stages. So I said to myself, I need to be certified in them. Well, that wasn't even legal at that time. Brian Lynch and I snuck through a loophole that we found in the law so that we could become certified K through 12. Normally you have to be, you know, the kindergarten and preschool usually together and then elementary and then junior high and then high school. And then you have to have a separate degree to teach college. We just said, we're going to get it all. So we figured out a way to do it. And afterwards they changed the law <laughs> in Michigan. So no one else could ever do it again. But that's, so I'm certified in all these things and ended up in a Waldorf school teaching everything from preschool through 12th grade. I taught all kinds of things as well as I was a class teacher. But getting a master's degree in um, administration was so that I could uh, be a principal. I really wanted to be a principal or a superintendent I think you have to preface this, but because when you say, and I was a class teacher, what that actually means, because in Waldorf education, after kindergarten, you get a, a class teacher. And as you go through year after year, they stay with that group. And so you develop with the teacher through all this curriculum. And we're going to probably spend three or four sessions on Waldorf because I'm obsessed. It's, you know, I, I gave up being a priest and, and leading a congregation to becoming a Waldorf teacher and leading a class of uh, children and also helping run the school because Waldorf teachers are also administrators. And I had a long history in it and that, that well, it'll take a long time to describe. But anyway, let's go back to the Institute. So here we go. We're in a place where the <laughs> Catholic Church is giving out degrees for people to study karma and reincarnation theosophy, uh, every crazy spiritual thing. If I told you some of the crazy ideas that Steiner has, which are not crazy because the Bible backs it up, uh, and seldom ever does Steiner not agree with the Bible. He may expand on it, but he seldom ever disagrees with it. So here you have the Catholic Church giving out these degrees and these things, and I'm so happy because in like one of the first classes, Hans Gabert is teaching us and he's teaching math and somebody just some crazy guy who did in fact go crazy uh, blurts out something about, well, is that what ectoplasm is? You know, and I'm like, yes, let's talk about ectoplasm. <laughs> well, Hans didn't know what ectoplasm was, you know, so here I'm finding out that even my teachers, these anthroposophical leaders, they're not clairvoyant. They may have some, what Steiner calls, intellectual clairvoyance. In other words, they've trained their mind in Steiner's system to become clairvoyant, and they now have certain sensitivities where they can begin, as John just said, to sense things that you don't usually see, that you don't smell, taste, touch, hear, or whatever, the five senses. No, there's other senses. And so you, they start to have some of these. Now, Werner, let's talk about individuals here. Werner, my teacher, he would act like he was clairvoyant, right? He would get, he'd get you in his room and he'd get in this condition and he'd get this look on his face and he'd take his glasses off dramatically and throw them on the desk and look at you like this. And you'd go, Werner, are you trying to act like you're clairvoyant or something? You know? <laughs> and, and he, he fooled a lot of people. A lot of people thought he had great clairvoyant insight. He just, he was just smart. He was really wise guy. He'd give really great <laughs> advice. You know, he wasn't 
very clairvoyant, but he had some intellectual clairvoyance, you know, and he had capacities. He had 54 lectures memorized word for word with inflections and with uh, comic interludes and everything imaginable. And, and you'd go up and you'd look at this book that he's supposedly reading from. There's nothing in the book. It's in his head. He was an actor. He trained in London uh, in some famous uh, drama school there. And he, he didn't need a microphone. He could fill the entire room with his speech. And he was so dramatic. I loved him. Some people thought he was a little much, that he was a little over the top. But uh, was he clairvoyant? No. Was Hans clairvoyant? No. Was Mariana clairvoyant? No. Was Taylor clairvoyant? No. Were any of those people, Ralph, any of them clairvoyant? No. But here they're teaching in a school that if you use the methodology, supposedly, you become clairvoyant. Well, imagine that. Here I am sitting there, clairvoyant from birth, wishing I wasn't, thinking I'm cursed, and now everybody else is <laughs> trying to become clairvoyant. What a strange thing. Well, there was always uh, people like Janet McGavin floating around that, that did have certain faculties. But many of the people, it's true, that that would come to anthroposophy. Out of, out of the people that would come to anthroposophy, there was a certain percentage that were trying to solve questions they had about experiences that they had that were super sensible, like myself, for example. I mean, I had had experiences my whole life that, that couldn't be explained by the kind of stuff they were telling me in school. And it's like, you know, they'd be saying this stuff and I'm looking at them going, that's not right. You know, I just, I'd lose interest because I think, oh, they, I, I thought it was idiotic because it was like they had this very uh, truncated view of the world and, and it didn't explain things that I had seen. So true. If, if I was to have chosen a profession, it would have been uh, being a parapsychologist, studying people like myself to demonstrate that there is a spiritual world and that there, that it's all connected. And that once you open yourself up uh, selflessly, that you can uh, attain to these uh, super sensible perceptions. So, you know, here I am, I'm studying uh, angels and archangels and archai and getting into the archangelic periods and this and that. You know, now I had read by that time every single Steiner book in English. Now, sounds like I'm bragging. There weren't that many at that time. <laughs> There's about half as many as there are now, right? So I'm still now reading books that I'm going, oh, Lord, I've never even seen this. They just translated it. So, you know, you're going to be a missionary if you're going to study and promulgate anthroposophy in America if you don't speak German and have access to the collected edition. Because in the collected edition in Germany, you just go in, you put in a, a keyword, it'll give you every, you know, it does a search, it pulls out every single keyword. In America, we have the Rudolf Steiner archive. It does some of that, but uh, it does that, but it doesn't have all those stuff in it. So we had to always, you know, be subject to somebody saying, well, but in the German it says, you know, and so these <laughs> people always, they, they'd read a Steiner verse, and then they'd say, and now in German, and then they'd read it in German. Uh, so these were old world, in most cases, uh, Europeans, but some not, who would come to the Institute and teach. Now, as John said, you want to talk about clairvoyance? How about Carlo Pietzner? Yeah. Carlo Pietzner could feel the disturbance of a, a, a mouse thought in the back of the room, and it would, <laughs> and he'd, oh, hi, my mouse. I mean, <laughs> he he was amazing. If you would come in, it was amazing because if you'd come in late to his lecture, he'd start over again and give you a summary, give the person who came in a summary, which kind of helped the people who were slow catching on anyway, but he'd give a summary. Anyone in the room he was sensitive to, he couldn't allow you to be lost in what it was that he was saying. And he was just like Meredith Thomas was, the man who taught me up in... Uh, in Shimmy, Alaska, when I was in the military. He was a huge guy, but you never knew it because he was always bent over down to his eyes were at your level, always bending over. you know. And when he'd shake your hand, he'd hold it with two hands and he'd look into your soul. And you know, you didn't, I'm certain that he saw into people's souls even without asking them ahead of time if he could look. So. Well, when you get 
in in the vicinity of a sensitive. I would call him like a sensitive. And it, it wasn't clair, clairvoyance isn't just about seeing. It's also about that realm of feeling to where you have this this empathy with a person to the point to where you really receive a feeling content uh, from the person that you're talking to. And uh, Rudolf Steiner back in uh, like 1908 on May 31st said, one says a lot about wisdom, but wisdom isn't what's often called wisdom today. One gets smart through experience, but wisdom is the force that streams into us from the spiritual world and then streams out again. Wisdom also comes from the mouth of babes. When what streams out comes more from the feeling realm, it's wisdom. But when it stimulates a man into action so that productivity predominates, it's love. But one has to know what love really is. Someone may feel sympathy for a man's misfortune, but that isn't real love. Sympathy only becomes love if one steps in and helps him. Wisdom and love make up the eye. The eye is love and wisdom that have become will. This is the higher triad. Yes, I'm studying that right now a lot. You know, we, uh, if you are really wise and you look at a plant, it will speak to you of the wisdom that is inherent in it. Our whole world is created by wisdom, but so what? Nature is also the bloody tooth and fang of nature. So it's filled with wisdom, but it doesn't mean it's filled with love. So we, through our love right now, create the future incarnation of the earth. In other words, our heaven, what we would call heaven when we become angels. And so love is the key factor. And that's the thing that all these Waldorf teach, all these anthroposophical teachers, because in the Waldorf Institute, there was an orientation year. So they would basically, and everyone went through that, you're supposed to. It would make you study things and you'd have to rewrite everything you ever thought you understood about the world, unless you'd already become very familiar with Rudolf Steiner. So people, they were, you know, these were geniuses. Some of the people who came to this course that uh, I was in class with, many of them are still doing a leisure painting. They're doing sculpture. They're doing, you know, they're the lead thinkers. They're, you know, I could list all of these people. And you, if you knew anthroposophy, you'd go, oh, well, those are like, those are the, the, the wise old gray hairs now. Yes, those are the people who, that I was in the course with. And I can tell you that I taught there and was there for 11 years and that there was just a certain few years when uh, some people came that just took up anthroposophy and have never put it down and carried it much further forward. So here we are, you know, uh, getting these teachers coming in like Carla Pietzner, like John Davies, like uh, Norman Davidson, like uh, Annalise Davidson, his uh, the eurythmist. So we had every type of artist and um, uh, biodynamic agriculture. We had uh, handcrafts. We had all these heavy thinking things. We had doctors, Dr. Otto Wolf, one of the most amazing people. He was clairvoyant, but he was clairvoyant because he'd been a doctor for so long that when Rudolf Steiner says, well, you could see the etheric body in the action of this uh, in horsetail, he, he could see it. No, not just he didn't read it. He saw it. And he would come and he he would every year give presentations that would just blow me away because he was teaching basically uh, anthroposophical medicine. We also had people teach astrosophy. We had the top, top teachers in the whole world come. And I would say that probably 75% of them had exactly what John said, a certain sensitivity that was leading to intellectual clairvoyance. And in some cases, uh, some outright clairvoyance, Hagen Bassant's, yeah, Virginia Seas, uh, a lot of these people did have clairvoyance. And it was just an honor to be taught by them. I tell you, it was the, the greatest, the greatest Rudolf, honor. Rudolf Grosser. Rudolf Grosser, oh, he was very clairvoyant. That, I tell that story about it when I first met him in, in uh, Dornock. And he was so used to it because he was one of the few clairvoyants, you know, especially in Europe where they tend to be a little bit stodgy, you know, a little <laughs> bit uptight. And uh, he just loved Americans because, you know, America is the land of people with too much willpower, you know. And uh, so if you're clairvoyant and, you know, you're having all these experiences, clairvoyant, clairsentient, clairaudient, 
uh, then you're usually spouting it, you know, you're usually spitting it out. Because in America, we get to say and do whatever the heck we want. In Europe, they're a little bit more cultured. Yeah, in polite society, certain things aren't done. <laughs> That's right. It's That's like right. If, if you look at like a Jane Austen novels and you see the conflicts that people have is based on that, well, these things just aren't said. So they never have that conversation that could have fixed whatever problem they were having in their relationship because it's just not done. <laughs> exactly. I watch too many British movies and that happens so much and it just infuriates me. Why didn't they just say another sentence? Why didn't they just say two more words and then they wouldn't have had 40 years of suffering? No. And that's the European thing. Matter of fact, it used to be because I was always breaking into the community instead of just, you know, going there nicely, and peacefully. I'd say, you know, I want to be a member of the first class. And Janet McGavin, who was quite clairvoyant, so was Eve. Hardy, we mentioned them before, and a lot of the female anthroposophists were incredible sensitives. But uh, Janet McGavin was the first class teacher. So to go into this higher rank, the, the highest rank of anthroposophy is the first class of uh, the high school of spiritual science. And uh, they read these lectures, uh, special lectures that are secret. They're not secret anymore. They're out in multiple versions in print now. So Janet says to me, well, you know, Douglas, how old are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't know, 24 or something. And she says, oh, well, you want to become a first class member, but you you just need to reach into the future and grab the capacities that you're going to develop between age 45 and 63. And then you'd be able to pull those back and have those. And then you'd be uh, ready for the first class. It's like, Okay, you just told me the only way I'm getting in is to do something impossible. Hmm. So I just used my willfulness because I'm a good American. And I said, oh, really? And so I recited to her the Foundation Stone Meditation by heart. Then I recited it to her in the rhythms. And then I recited, started reciting most of the meditations in Verses and Meditations by Rudolf Steiner, one after the next because I'd memorized all of them and I was using them and uh, and other things, even other secret meditations. And finally, at the end, after about a half an hour, she just goes, okay, I think you've done it. <laughs> you reached into the future and you grabbed the capacities and pulled them back. And so they allowed me in, you know, and I'm here, I am just a young punk and nobody got into those groups that was young. That was forbidden. They were, this is European stodgy, uh, stilted, uh, and you know, you had to wear your Birkenstocks with wool socks, and you had to have a scarf around your neck, and you and had you, to knit, and you had to knit. Of course, I became a good <laughs> knitter, you know, so they they had to kind of let me in eventually just simply because I went because you knew how to knit, <laughs> I knew how to knit, crochet, cross stitch, and weave, which you know, we do in the Waldorf school. I could play the recorder, you know, and so they had to let me in. So I stayed in that program for 11 years and I got uh, a BA and certified. And so I became a certified teacher, but during it, here are all these amazing teachers coming in and teaching new ways of looking at just about everything. Nothing was the same. Everything was different. Even philosophy. We had classes on philosophy. Well, I had a friggin' degree in philosophy. And it didn't matter I, what didn't prepare me for these exercises that these Europeans had worked out to get you to think in a different way, to unlearn. And so even though I thought I was all that, you know, before I came to the Institute, I found out I was not all that. I had some things really upside down and very confused and uh, found out, you know, that I needed to you know, be humble. Well, that was a terrible thing to have to know. And then uh, that I'd have to, because uh, I could memorize stuff, you know, so I was always just, well, I just out memorize you. <laughs> John, too, you've memorized so many things. And as a musician, I, I'm always in wonder. But then when I became a Waldorf teacher, literally, I, I can't even tell you how many hundreds of poems right now I could recite to you because why? I did them with motion, with eurythmy with dance, with Sufi dances. So I get up and we could Sufi dance all day long and I wouldn't have to look up anything. Why? Because it went right into your bones. And this is what they were trying to teach you. 
don't just get it in your head because you'll go crazy. And don't get it in your heart because then you, you might become luciferic and think you're all that when you really have misunderstood <laughs> major portions of anthroposophy. So you have to get it in your will. So a lot of these people that I was in class with, they became, as I said, they became eurythmists, they became artists, they become leisure painters and sculptors and all these kind of things. So they said, I don't need the cosmology. I need the heart forces. I need the will forces. And so they would become, you know, even a Waldorf teacher, they might become, but focused on the arts and not really into anthroposophy. So if you ask them, well, you know, what's the eighth sphere? They wouldn't know. If you asked them, you know, how many incarnations does the earth have? They probably wouldn't know. If you said, uh, you know, what was the hierarchy that was a uh, human during the ancient sun, old sun period? They wouldn't know. Matter of fact, I go to groups where there were these ancient anthroposophists in study groups who didn't know the basics. <laughs> so in the end, they asked me to become the teacher of the teachers for the Waldorf School because nobody else actually understood it in the end. And that's the embarrassing thing. Well, that and that's the challenge because if you attempt to study anthroposophy with your abstract mind, good luck because you're going to get to the end of the page which is might be the end of the paragraph and you'll get to the end of that paragraph and they'll go what just happened <laughs> yeah, what did so, he do <laughs> what what was that because you have to be able to hold the the whole content of that paragraph to get to the end and be able to to have a uh, uh, an approach toward understanding. And I only say an approach toward understanding because everything is, of course, multi-layered, multi-dimensional, depending on what time frame in history and within what kind of context. And so that it, it becomes this continual uh, puzzle. And so that for me, I, I learned quite early on that I had to live in the realm of questions, that I I wasn't uh, there to get closure because that's that whole idea that oh, I got it, I figured it out. If you if you want closure, study mathematics. You're going to get that kind of closure. But if you try and extrapolate and take that up into other areas of study, where you need art, see, and that's the thing. That's the beauty realm, you know. So you have that wisdom. But what that's going to do is get you to a certain point. You have to be able to bring in the beauty element to which develops the etheric body so that you don't reincarnate and you're like at a deficit in that realm. And, you know, you end up being a, some kind of idiot or something. Uh, and then the whole idea of being able to take what you've learned and actually act on it, actually uh, actively do things that, that, express the action and that's love that's that's the future you know and it, it's it's a challenge because once people get this whole idea tag you're it you know you're it's up to you you know it's not somebody you can't sit around and wait for that the, the guy to come along and rescue you you have to rescue the world so true matter of fact that is what I don't know if we've said this before. I know in previous talks in the past we have said it, but I'd go to all these ancient anthroposophists, you know, uh, I would way out of my way to meet everyone I could to talk to them about their biography, ask them a few questions about Steiner. And in the end, when I'd finally say to them, you know, uh, anthroposophy is not growing very much. How, how, how are we going to, you know, grow? How are we going to get bigger? How are we going to spread this? Uh, you know, and uh, get more people. And in every case, they do what you just said. It's up to you now. <laughs> it's like, up up to me? Well, the, I doubt if it's going to happen, <laughs> if it's up to me. and But they all said that. There's just a few of them. And the other thing is, is you go into these communities and you try to make your way into them, both in America and in Europe and other places, and you would make such resistance. And then eventually, when you'd get upset, they'd say, well... You can only come to it if it's your karma. It's like you just, it was like a slap across the face. No, I make my own karma. 
Okay, don't tell me my karma is going to limit me from joining one of your secret groups. No, or the, to, to limit me from understanding this. No, it really comes down to the fact that these beautiful souls that were the teachers there uh, were there through their biography showing you how to apply anthroposophy. None of those people were theoretical, as John says. They weren't abstract. They aren't going to go into abstract. They're going to talk about practical. They're going to make it real. And that is the difference between theosophy and anthroposophy and between anthroposophy, spiritual science, and most other spiritual paths, including religions. It's applicable. You can take what Steiner says. You can apply it. So eventually, and while I was in the Institute, I didn't really for sure know, but because I was working at the Waldorf School and I just love children and, you know, the younger they are, the better they are, the better to me. I love little preschool children. And infants, I love infants. Uh, but, uh, you know, the thing I really love is stimulating the minds of those who are going to be the Waldorf teachers in the classroom so that they would have spiritual content behind what they're saying. Because my teachers had tremendous spiritual content. They had amazing biographies. They'd made it in the real world. And then they applied anthroposophy in their profession and took their profession forward, did what Rudolf Steiner says, use anthroposophy to drive uh, cultural um, evolution forward spiritually. And so eventually, as I'm in the Institute, I realize, dang, I don't want to be a priest anymore. I don't, I don't want to have a congregation. I just want to be a Waldorf teacher and just, you know, teach Waldorf because Waldorf has anthroposophy in it and, you know, be an anthroposophical teacher and basically just uh, continue to work with the children as every spiritual teacher says to me when they meet me. They put their head on my forehead and they tell me the same message. So I finally got it. Keep teaching the children. Yes. And, and you, you have become, geez, just a sterling example. I can't go on and on is that I could back up so many of the things that, that Douglas says because I was there. But anyways, this is so much fun. I hate to draw it to a close, but uh, we try to keep these so that they're not over long and we are going to be back again soon anyway. So that's okay. But I want to thank the, the ingenious Tyler Gabriel for dreaming this up and putting us together in this way. And so it gives me a chance to learn a lot about my best friend, Douglas. Thank you very much.